welcome. And uh, my name is Michael Kilpatrick. Uh, I'm a deacon in the church. Uh, this is my home parish. Uh, I was ordained here just about 11 months ago. And uh, before that, I was a virgin here, and also at St. John's Cathedral in Denver. And I've been in the conflict resolution business for about 20 something years. And mutual and probably over 6,000 of disputes, ranging from dollar marking cases to uh, guardianships, end of life, mediations, and civil harassment, and a lot of things like that. Um, so, So I have one big question for you to start, to start with. By the way, this is not a talk about this. It's going to be a bit interactive. But do you know the difference between a terrorist and a virgin? Anyone? You negotiate with a terrorist and not a virgin. That's right. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, OK. Uh, oh, re repeat what they say? Yeah. Um, yeah the, uh, you can negotiate with a terrorist, but not so much with a virgin. And um, so, what we're going to talk about today, and I know that being a virgin or having been a virgin, I took my virgin away from me. And uh, we have a lot of conflict. Uh, there's a lot of things that go on in virgin, getting people to point A and point B, but it's how we do it and what we do. And a lot of times, there's a lot of confusion and a lot of conflict. So what we're going to talk about today is, uh, first, this is going to be a little bit interactive, so I'm going to ask you questions. And this is not a presentation about the theology of conflict or reconciliation. This is about the basics of conflict and how we deal with conflict. And wondering if God is on our side, of course, and asking what, what is conflict, how we respond to conflict, and talking about a diagnostic tool I think you might enjoy, which is called the Wheel of Conflict. And staying calm, being curious, fundamental attribution error, reflecting and reframing, and we get to do some exercises with me with that. Emotional intelligence, and talking about facts, and finally, having conflict starting with emails. Now, a good part of my career was in the uh, Higher education is an opposite. And uh, I can tell you about half the you know, cases that came to me over the years started with emails. And so that we'll have a nice conversation about that. So, God is on my side. And uh, it's true that God is. And I've had so many cases where I've been in church mediations where people think that God is on my side, therefore I am right and they're wrong. And uh, God expects us to address the issues honestly, with good faith, and truth, and in love. So, conflict. And some of my little uh, things here, I forgot, I hit the wrong one on this, so it takes forever, I'm sorry. So, the range of conflict. What do you think the range of conflict is? Ron, okay. Mild disagreement to outright war. Well, you got it. You must have looked at my slides before. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, some, some little disagreement just maybe be a kind of a passing thing to all out war. And little things like little disagreements, and I tell stories through this too, can turn into all out wars. Um, one case that I did some years ago involved uh, a lizard. And I mediated a lizard case um, where two people who lived together uh, shared exotic lizards. And one moved out because she was moving in with her boyfriend and couldn't have a pet. So she sold her lizard to her friend. And one day while visiting her former lizard, she noted that the lizard was not doing lizard things and didn't look happy and all that. So the other person took offense, threw her out of the house, 
told her never to come back. And the next thing you know, the person who sold the lizard filed a small claims action. Well, before that, she went to the lizard and had the lizard because she had a key to the apartment. Police got involved, and uh, no charges were filed, but she filed a small claims case for one penny, which I think I have the world's record of mediating the lowest amount of money ever in mediation. But uh, I was pulled into this in a small claims court, and it ended up, uh, you could hear these people across the courtyard in this courtroom. And uh, four or five deputies were in the, in the uh, courtroom trying to separate them. Uh, so this little thing actually turned into basically a, a nuclear war. Anyway, it ended up with uh, the case being dropped by the plaintiff and, um, and visitation rights with the lizard via Zoom uh, once a month for one hour. So a good outcome, I guess. The, the point being of this is that small things matter just as much as the big things. You might think it's nothing, but it's really a big deal. So you treat it as such. And it's about opportunity. So what is conflict? The gentleman in the back said it's about differences. And it is. And how is conflict expressed? Question for you. How so? It could be a calm discussion of different opinions. Um, it could be people not talking and behaving in ways that they wouldn't normally behave, or, um, you know, it, it's just such a wide range. It could be a simple, I'm not talking to Kyle because I'm not happy with how he did something, to I'm going to. <clears throat> Um, manipulate other people because I'm upset with Jerry and sabotage what he does. Um, just a wide range depending on the situation. So you're right. Conflict is expressed in words. It may be expressed in actions. And it may be in silence. And, um, and so we always talk about this in the amygdala, that little gland having a brain where it's the primitive brain which causes people to do, you know, it's the fright, flight, and fight response. And that's what people typically do. So what I'd like for you to do here, uh, to participate in this little exercise, is I'm going to say a word. And when I say a word, I'd like for you to call out what word comes to your mind first. Don't think about it, just whatever word it comes to your mind. So you ready? Everybody's ready. I can see that everybody's wow. eager to go. <laughs> okay. All right. The word is conflict. Say it loud. Anger. Fight. Revolution. What else? Revolution. What? Okay. Understanding? Did you say something here? Disbelief. Okay. Any others? Avoidance. Avoidance. Okay. So here's the thing. A lot of research has been done on this. There's a rational view of conflict. And believe it or not, I think I heard one positive thing said. All the rest were negative. And the rational view of conflict is negative. That's why we run away, we fight, or we turtle up, we just freeze up or something like that. Because we're wired for this. And, you know, most of us are conflict avoidant. When you ask people, they will tell you they don't like to get into conflict whatsoever. And the irrational view of conflict <coughs> is those things, peace and understanding, Respect, reconciliation. People don't understand often, they really don't get that conflict is an opportunity to learn. And so, you have to get past this rational view and, and go to the irrational view of things to try to learn from the circumstance. 
And it's often about perspective and just how we see things. And because we're all different. But we get into conflict because they're right or we're right and they're wrong. There's no other explanation. We just feel it. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, a diagnostic tool called the Wheel of Conflict. And I don't know if any of you have seen this. Bernie Meyer of uh, Craig University Law School came up with this some years ago. And it's a great diagnostic tool, to, one, to identify what persons need their needs, but also those things that stand in the way of getting those needs. Um, so, so I'll go through these just kind of really quick. Can anybody think of what might stand in the way of getting what you want? <coughs> Sorry? Okay. okay. I wasn't sure I heard it. Opposition. Okay. Others? Scarcity. Scarcity. That's going to come up. Yep. Fear. Fear. Right. So, values is one of them. You know, we all have values. We're all a product of our culture. And those values are somewhat different. We're from the south and north, from California. Louisiana or you know from Stockton or San Diego there's culture affects values you know uh, another one is going to be structure the structure you're working within and we'll talk more about these in just a minute the history that you may that may involve the conflict emotions of course affect communications so needs what do you think people look for when it comes to needs? Safety. What's important? Safety. Safety, all right. Any others? Control. Control. Any others? Acceptance. I'm sorry? Acceptance. Acceptance. I heard someone, I heard another one. Solution. Solution, okay. Respect. So, I'm sorry? Respect. 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 Absolutely. So the first one here is the survival needs. Somebody touched on that. Safety. Food, shelter, health, and security. It's not something you deal with, for, with for, as being a virgin so much, but you know, maybe you do it in the ministry or something. Interest needs. Substantive. I'm not really sure what substantive means. I was going to take that out because I wasn't sure what it meant. But, but uh, procedural things where you're sure of a certain process uh, and you have that protection of that process. And then the psychological comfort of, of, of process. But three of you mentioned what's next, and that's what they call identity based needs. And those needs are things like meaning and community, that's belonging, uh, intimacy, being a part of a group, sharing that group, doing what they do, and then autonomy. And when you, get, when you can't get those things, you usually have the conflict rising or something. So, communication. How many of you in here are good communicators? Raise your hand. How many of you are good communicators? Are you good? All right? Good. That's good. Yeah. Falls are really good. Okay. All right. Now, how many of you, and we do, people believe we're perfect communicators? Not true. And especially when we get upset. How many of here are really good communicators when you're mad? You're very rare. God bless you for it. <laughs> it's, uh, and we have to be, because you know, as a virgin, as a minister working in the church, you have to be clear, and you have to be able to control what's going on and what you're saying. But typically, when we get upset, we don't communicate well. And what happens when we're in conflict, we assume that we do communicate. Well, we 
we leave big gaps because of our own emotions not And uh, many things contribute, obviously, to uh, communication, whether it's culture. I mean, I tell people this all the time. When I try to communicate with my grandchildren, this is not easy. And uh, um, they kind of look at me like, gosh, what are you talking about? And I have no idea what they're talking about half the time. But, you know, gender, age, class, environment, uh, and just culture in general. Uh, my wife is from West Africa, and sometimes after 30 years, we still uh, lose things in translation so, from her, her culture. And here's a really big one, that most people when they're angry try to solve the problem before they know what the problem actually is. Because they rush in to try to solve the problem. And uh, so that's an important thing. So communication will get in the way of needs, to be sure. Uh, emotions are that thing that gives conflict energy. And uh, why do you think emotions supports a conflict? Does it give courage? Well, gives you strength to give you courage and force to a conflict. Some people, once in conflict, they, they will say things they would never otherwise say or do. And, uh, and they're also, also often the key to de escalating uh, a conflict. We'll talk about some of those in a little bit. What do you think structure means? How would that affect a conflict? Hierarchy. Right. The search of the hierarchy. Anybody else? Boundaries. I'm sorry? Boundaries. Boundaries. Boundaries, yes, absolutely. Now, others? So you could say established relationships. Mm -hmm. say, say that one more time. I heard it. Previously established relationships. Yes. Okay, previously established relationships. So it's a hierarchy. It could be just how we've always done business. It could be about available resources. You don't have the resources to do something. Does that have to be structured? Um, time limitations. It has to be done by 5 o'clock. And you can't even get anybody together to talk about it before that time. Decision making procedures. That's a hierarchy. And you've got to talk to this person, and then that person, and then this person. You may not get what you want. When I was an ombudsman, people would come in all the time and say, I want to do this. Professors would bring this issue, some issue to me, or even students. And I'd say, well, what's the student handbook say? Or what's the uh, university handbook say? The rule is you can't do this. If you want to change it, you have to take it to the you know, uh, faculty senate or something like that. So there's procedures. And uh, uh, then the actual physical setting. We aren't really talking about it because you have to be quiet or, or just whatever. You can't address the issue at the moment. Organizational structure and, and legal limits. Uh, maybe you can't talk about it because you're under a gag with it. Or uh, <coughs> something like politics, of course. And access to information. We'll talk about this more in a few minutes, but one of the things that people do in conflict is often assume that they understand exactly what you understand. You have the same information, and that's not true. So, and then the last one is distribution of resources. So, um, so what about history? How would history figure into dealing with a conflict? Right. Or just, you know, um, assumptions based on what happened in the past. Bad, bad interactions in the past, bad blood between people. Anything else? A perpetual problem that never seems to get solved and people get more aggravated as 
not, I'm sorry, a perpetual problem that never seems to get solved, where the emotion just continue to boil over. Right. And uh, where things just keep going on and on and on. It's, um, you know, you can't deal with a conflict unless you understand the history of it. And uh, that history might be a few minutes old, or that history might be 2,000 years old. And uh, um, so it gives, it's very much like emotions, it gives uh, the conflict momentum, it keeps it going, as you were saying. Things will just keep going and going. And it also becomes the history itself becomes part of the identity of the person or the persons involved in the conflict. Um, you know, it affects the values, the styles, and the emotional reactions of people and the structure that they may operate. Um, and as we were saying, you know, history will feed a conflict forever if it's not dealt with. You know, if it's, if it's bad blood, there's bad blood. And uh, it just keeps going on. Then values. Um, what do you think values is? Well, I think belief system. <clears throat> That's a belief system. The difference between right and wrong. You know, principles that direct our lives, the culture that affects them. And our age, and even where we live, we live in San Diego, and you live in Stockton. I can promise you, there's going to be some differences in how we see things, right and wrong, or what's maybe what's good and evil, even, or something like that. But values are very different, especially in the cultural context. And these types of conflicts, it's been my experience that if the person comes in. And the first thing they say is, they've offended me because I don't believe what they believe. You almost have an intractable conflict from the outside. Uh, yes, you're going to ask some questions, and we'll talk about that in a minute too, but you, know, you have to get to the bottom of it. But people will take a very hard line at this point. And it always, it always becomes personal. Uh, there's a book out, some of you may have read it, uh, Getting to Yes, by Fisher and Murray of the uh, Harvard Negotiation Project at Harvard Law School. Their first, one of their first rules, it's the Bible of negotiation, and their first rule is separate the person from the problem. <laughs> but if it's so personal, you can't do it, this becomes very difficult to do. And um, if a conflict is, is such a place that it's, it's that person, or they're just confused about what's going on and how they're going to do things, uh, and they feel under attack, it will always become an issue of values. They may not be able to identify what the real issue is, so it just becomes a personal thing. And when that happens, uh, it narrows a lot of options. And, in the conflict resolution world, we call this entrapment. It's not legal entrapment. But uh, a type of thing where a person takes a position so long with such gusto that they can't change their minds and won't change their minds. And do you know why? Loss of face. What was that? Loss of face. Yeah. They won't do it because they lose face. And which is a pretty awful thing to do when you're looking at things that uh, would be corrective or reduce and de escalate the conflict that you just do. So you end up with pretty much this thing. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and this is how people they come in with this sort of mindset you're wrong, I'm right. Uh, you're, it's impossible for you to be correct in this thing. I'm wrong. And so the real answer to this then is keep calm and stay curious. Now I'm going to add, throw one thing in here that's kind of off. What is the worst thing you can tell somebody that's angry? Calm down. Calm down. Right. Don't tell them to calm down. It's one of the worst things you can say to someone. It will escalate the conflict in a heartbeat. But here's the thing, the real thing here is 
Ask him what's happened. Stay curious and ask what happened. It's not about me, it's not about you, and it's not about being right or wrong, but finding out what they're thinking and letting them know what you're thinking and what's going on. So three shifts that you make at what's happening. You go from certainty of truth. My position is the only good position, my way or the highway. I'm right. Two, a curiosity about your position or their, your perceptions and their perceptions. And you have to ask them. And you leave the blame, you go from blame, because if you look at somebody and say, you did this to me, you're blaming. You start with the you, it's always a blame. And you start talking about looking at what they call contribution. In all the disputes that I've mediated in my career, uh, I can say that probably 90% of them, all the parties were blamed. Uh, all of them. But the thing is, moving from that blame game to finding out, said, look, I was out of line when I said this. Uh, how, did that, how did that affect you? And then the other thing is attributions about the other's intentions. Yeah, the next slide actually comes up and says, don't assume I share your assumptions. Funny thing about conflict is we tend to think that they believe that we do. And uh, so you get away from attributions and bias and about their intentions, because you don't know what their intentions are or were, and you talk about how this has impacted you. This is what I see has happened. This is what I think has happened. And this is how it's affected me. How did it affect you? Be surprised how much this will start bringing things down. Asking, you know, telling them how it impacted you without blaming. You know, I, it's the old I statement thing. I believe this happened. This is how I see what happened. This is how it impacted me. And then ask them, let them ask the same question. So don't assume I share your assumptions. So a few old things about fundamental attribution here. Then what do you think? I don't know if any of you have experience of this. What do you think this is? Take a guess. This is kind of a funny, fun thing to me. Well, I'll go ahead and put it up there. It's our tendency to attribute other people's behaviors to dispositional factors while attributing our action to situational factors. One of the examples I like to use of this is if you're from San Diego, and when the Chargers were here, you know, and the Chargers played the Raiders, the Raiders are evil people. Well, we know this because, well, they're up from, they were from Oakland. <laughs> and so they had to be evil. Or if you're driving down the highway and a, a, a person in an F-150 passes you, pulls just in front of you, cuts you off, and drives off on the exit. And you're sitting there thinking, those people that drive Ford F-150s are all crazy, they're out to kill me. And you got to watch out for them because they're all bad people. It's also true. And so what you're dealing with is if, you, if something is going on with somebody, you think that if they do something, it's about their mindset. It's how they're wired. They're not good people. They do things they ought not to do. But if it's you, and the Ford 150 is just cut off. It's a situational thing. It's not your fault. It's the devil makes for it for something like that. So it's, and we tend to do that a lot when it becomes in conflict. You know, I'm right, you're wrong, and then it goes deeper that you're just a bad person. But 
you know, stuff happens when it, when it comes to me. And so I couldn't have it. But you could have helped it. So that's an information error. So, um, and it happens like the Ford F-150. One of the, uh, I remember one time uh, listening to somebody get into an argument at a mall during Christmas. And they lost the parking place. And this is a good example of attribution error as well. Somebody cut in front of them because there was a parking place right in front of the door. And the person in the car was being vocal, if you can imagine that, about how that person cut them off. And things kind of calmed down when they saw them pull the wheelchair. You know, don't know why they were trying to get it. There was a good reason they were trying to get into that spot. But it didn't make, it make them evil people. They would made you mad. But, uh, and attribution error again, the examples I've used to turn on impact. How something impacted you see the other side. So, working to be aware of your attributions, you're aware of your intentions, but you're not aware of theirs. You're aware of what motivates you, but you can't possibly understand theirs. And you're aware of how you are impacted, but you're not aware of how they were impacted. And that's what you've got to ask them. That's why you have to be curious and talk to them. And I know virgins never have conflict. You know, it just never comes up that uh, you don't get into issues at church ever. <laughs> never. And uh, I think a lot of times of when you're doing multiple churches that it's sort of like a consecration or something like that. And you have people from different churches operating and you're on one side and explaining how this is supposed to work with somebody and somebody on the other side of the church is explaining it differently to someone. Because that's how they do it. And, uh, and it turns out to something like this. I am what I think. I'm a good person. You are what you do. So, next time you kind of get into a conflict, kind of keep that in mind. Attribution error is a big thing when it comes to conflict. Now, um, that's a difficult slide. I'm not sure you it's here. So, here's where you get to work now. Reflecting and reframing. What do you think I mean about reflecting? Somebody's talking with you. What do you what do you think I'm talking about when I say reflecting? Well, it could mean thinking back about how you got there, but it could also mean taking what you say and putting it back on yourself to see how you feel about what you just said. That's partly right. Uh, that you know you're reflecting it back. What you're doing is you're uh, you're mirroring what they said. Uh, parody that, and the reason you do that is to let them know you're, that they're being heard. So if somebody tells me, Michael, A, B, C, D, E, F, I'm going, okay, I just heard you say, correct me if I'm wrong, that's a by the way a statement of body language, you're opening yourself up. Correct me if I'm wrong, you said A, B, C, D, E, F, is that correct? And I said, yes. So they know they're being heard to de-escalate things. Oftentimes, in a mediation, I will look at somebody after they tell me, Michael, A, B, C, D, E, F. I will say to them, A, B, C, D. And I go, no. You forgot the E and the F part. And I do that to make sure they're listening to me. And it's kind of, I don't think it's a dirty trick, but I think it's, it's, it's an important thing Make sure they're just as engaged in the present as I am. So, reflecting is just repeating back what you just heard so they know they're being heard, know they're being heard accurately. Now, reframing is a totally different thing. That's putting, um, taking what somebody said, usually something that's very intense and very angry and putting it out there without all the anger and the frustration that they used to help the escalate. 
And then reframing, just taking that negative statement to a neutral and positive statement that accurately tells them they've been hurt. So we're going to do three little exercises. So you've got to jump into this. See if you can do it. There's no wrong answer. And I can tell you, this is hard stuff. Uh, experienced mediators struggle with this. But, you know, give it a try and see what you think. So here's some rules for reframing. You don't judge what you've heard. You try to find the essential message that the person's trying to communicate. And the statement that's hardest to hear, where they're, what they're really angry about, and then what their interest, what they want, and then how the statement can be reframed to emphasize something positive. So here's the first one. You are always telling me what I do is wrong, and that is why I do not listen to you. Why should I listen when, if I'm wrong, always wrong? How would you reframe that? Any takers? Huh? So if I hear you right, what you're telling me is that you think that I think you're always wrong. Okay. You know, they know they've been heard with that. Absolutely. Any others? Thank you. So what I'm hearing you tell me is that you would like me to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You would like me to approach you in a way that, um, I don't want to say makes you feel like you're right, because that sounds kind of condescending, doesn't it? Um, um, what you would like me to do is collaborate with you and talk about how I would like to do things. Yeah, that's right too. Any others? I mean, that's, that's, that's good. That's good. Any others? Here's, here's what was said. Here's the reframing. It is important to you to get positive feedback and hear from me that you're doing well. <laughs> so both of you touched us. And uh, that's good. Okay, number two. People here are spoiled and stupid. They have good lives themselves and with more autonomy than most, but they seem to have forgotten what it really means to have responsibilities. So what I think I'm hearing you tell me is that um, the people here need to demonstrate what it means to have responsibilities because they have, because they're fortunate. I don't know. <laughs> Something good. like that. Yeah, that's good. Any others? That's uh, actually very good. Any others? Okay, here's the, here's the response. You feel that everyone gains a lot from working in this organization. It is important to you that everyone takes their responsibility seriously and does all the work that's expected. Ooh, very close. Very good. <laughs> that's a pretty drastic reframing of what was said. <laughs> but it, I, I, I mean, it's a, it's a I, I, really, I can't. I can't even get there from what the first statement is. Yeah. I, I don't know how to come to that conclusion. And if I'm having a discussion with somebody, I can't get all those words uh, because it seems it seems to me what they were saying before was that they just feel these people don't appreciate them. They're lazy and stupid. This, that I'm doing. I'm I'm doing all the work. You're not doing anything. You're lazy and stupid. Take some responsibility. And the way that's rephrased gives way more credit than I think that 
Well, I was trying to do that. But you're trying to de-escalate things. <laughs> and this person is clearly really upset with things like this. So you're, you're putting it in more neutral, positive language. Yeah. But you're still getting the message out that one they know they've been hurt. And saying so, that, you know, people do gain and have benefit from working here. But you want them to take responsibility for what they do. And because um, it's important to you. Good, thank you. I appreciate that. Now here's the last one. This is the tough one. Hell will freeze over before I will work with this jerk again. We were on the same team, and every day, every minute, it was an unadulterated torture, and I will not expose myself to his arrogance or sadism again. Have fun with this one. <laughs> okay, he's going to try. Saying it's hard to work with. <laughs> so I think what you're saying is that you would like a new team, or you would like to move to a different team, or like to explore the option of working with different people. That's part of the message, to be sure. Yeah. What's the other? What's the other part of the message? that you're frustrated. And to reframe this, you're going to first have to get out the fact that you get that they're frustrated. And then after that, say, is there anything that can be done to ameliorate this? But until you get <laughs> that they are completely through, no kidding, and let that, that be as it is, there's nothing else you can do. So once you put that out there, you know, I get what you're saying. Um, is there anything that can be done that would make this better? Yeah, that's kind of a part of the message. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I know the exercise was to reframe things in a certain way, uh -huh. but I think what I would do in that situation is just say, well, tell me more. Help me understand what you mean. Mm -hmm. Give me an example. One of the things about reframing is you're acknowledging what they've said. Remember, you know, this person is very upset and really wants change. You know, that's part of it. And so here's the answer. You have had a very bad experience working together and you do not want to repeat that experience. That's pretty clear. I've also heard you say that you were exposed to certain behaviors that were unacceptable and you feel you shouldn't have to deal with these in this workplace or anywhere for that matter. That was very clear too. And what you're acknowledging that's exactly what they've said. But, you know, hell will freeze over before I work with this jerk again. It's a little hostile, a little angry, and you can know, feel it. But reframing takes a lot of that out. It acknowledges that anger and acknowledges the need to move or for this behavior to stop so you're not exposed to it. So you've been good. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, um, one way you deal with some of these when you're working with people is through emotional intelligence. And um, that is not just about you, but it's also, you know, understanding where the other person is coming from as well. You're about to have, you're, somebody wants to engage you in a conversation that might be a little um, tough to deal with, but you've just got a ticket. Or somebody is sick in your home. Uh, or you're just sick. You're not feeling well. You know, you have to be aware of those things before you jump into a conversation. Because it's going to affect how the conversation comes out. And at the same time, having that same awareness that, let's say, somebody's coming to you and um, having, you know, whatever problem they're having, 
And you, you have an awareness of it. Or you just have an awareness of being very tentative and very frightened uh, to you know, encourage them to talk and to relax. But one of the things about emotional intelligence is it tells you that you don't have to get into a heated conversation or a conflict at that moment. You can say, look, this is not a great time. Can we talk about this this afternoon? How about whatever time? You're acknowledging they want to talk. You're acknowledging it's urgent enough to have it that day. But maybe you need some time to kind of calm yourself or maybe take care of some business because one of your kids are sick or something like that. And using that to you know, to acknowledge them and yourself and to uh, you know, get that delay. Or if you go ahead with the conversation, just having an awareness of bias and some assumptions you might make, you might strike a chord and hit that button and get you upset. So you've got to be aware that button's out there. So you don't let them touch it. So, um, so you know your vulnerabilities, basically, that's what it's about. And how things affect you uh, is not how it affects somebody else. But if it's going to compromise your ability to have a decent conversation, uh, just take some time and uh, figure that out and then get into the conversation. And we argue about who is right. And this is kind of what happens in argument when we're getting to really conflict. Difficult conversations are not with about facts, hardly ever. Uh, they are about those things like judgments and values and interpretations, rules and expectations. You just don't, when people are getting into serious arguments and serious conversations about things that are very difficult, it's almost never about a fact. Nobody cares about facts. This is why you're in the Wider in this place. So, um, this is where again you step back and you say, What happened? You know, and because what happened will take you away from those assumptions and judgments. There's a thing called a ladder of inference, which I didn't put in here because it's just a little crazy. But it's how if we all sat together and said, This table is covered in black sheep. I think we would all agree that that's objectively true. But what happens with all of us is that once we see that, then there may be anything that goes on in this room that will change us and add something to that. That this table um, has some sort of crazy meaning. And then we act on that. And then we make it true for us. And then the next time we come around to seeing the black table, it's something that may be unpleasant for us. You know, you, you have to ask, you have to be curious, you have to talk with people, not to them, but at them. So, what do you think happened? Let me tell you what I think happened. So you can actually get to facts and uh, get away from all these things. So, talking about facts. It's another thing I was going to slide a while ago. It's moving from the certainty, your certainty, which is subjective, to being curious. And blaming to recognize a contribution again. That uh, contribution is more than it happens. And, and taking that assuming intent. You're a bad person, you're an evil person. Because you drive a Ford F-150. And I was somebody <laughs> tried to kill me when I was in time. And so you're just an evil person. But if you talk to them about this situation hurt me this way. How do you accept it? Go from that who's right to how you see things differently. People have different information than you do. They come from a different background, they come from different um, 
just different backgrounds. And if they're going to see things differently, that idea of perspective, then you're never going to come together to, to acknowledge what they see differently than you. And they hear what you're seeing differently from them. Do you have different data? You know, it's, it's amazing that people get into arguments and you ask, you ask the question in a mediation, did you know about this? Well, no. Okay. How does that change your position? Well, I have to think about this. I mediated a case years ago uh, where it involved a kidnapping that no one knew about. And the person was going through making all kinds of changes, um, uh, violating nature ratings. And there was a lawsuit, and you know, attorneys were involved all over the place. And this came out in the middle of it. And it changed the whole picture of how things were going to go. Um, facts that are objective facts, which is another thing out of that book, uh, getting to yes, using objective facts, and showing, giving you this different data to change everything. Different reason. We come from different backgrounds. What would you do uh, if? My thought process, how I process this problem, is different from yours. Uh, different experiences of the past, the history. They had a fight with this person six months ago, you know, and you lost. And uh, so you're not happy with them, and you're a little, a little leery of getting into another round with them. You know, you know, it's taking into account that experience in the past. And then what are your assumptions, your biases uh, that you may be harboring? It's, you know, it's perfectly fine to look at someone in a, in a conflict and say, was it your intention to do this? Are you assuming this? Because that puts it on the table. It's not blaming anybody for anything. It's just saying, we need to talk about this. Um, and do you operate under a different set of rules? Now, from the verger standpoint, and this is pretty interesting because, again, going back to that example where you're, you're verging a large service and different parishes are involved in that. And parish A does it this way, but you guys are doing it this way, but the rubrics and the program say this. And all this confusion starts. And so you have to kind of get everybody in the same page. Uh, it's you got to make sure people understand that whatever rules have been set up to operate on, those are the ones you operate on. And do you have preferences about how you want things to work? They might not like them. They may think they're the greatest thing since life's bread. But you got to stay there and talk about them. And, uh, and then be willing to get the feedback. So listening which is kind of an important thing. Here's a question for you. Can any of you tell me what time it is? Sure. Answers? Yes, we can tell. Okay. 440. 4.40. Yes, we can tell you. Any other answers? Well, the correct answer is yes. It's so the call of the question is not asking to tell me the time. Can you tell me the time? Listening is critical. I, when I used to prep people for depositions, this is one of the questions I would ask them, and virtually everyone would tell me the time. And so, no, listen to the question. The question is, can you tell me the time? And that's a yes or no question. So, listen to the call of the question. It's critical. And here's the other thing about listening to a positive question. You hear a question and you don't understand it, do you answer it? No. We ask for clarification. It's perfectly okay. Another thing about depositions and things like this, because if you answer the question, the person assumes you know that is the correct answer. And you're giving it. 
and you don't even understand what the question is. So ask for clarification if you don't get it. That's part of active listening. So clarify, reflect back what you've heard, sorry, and summarize what you've heard. Use your emotional intelligence. How are you feeling? How are they feeling? What kind of attributions and bias are entering into the conversation? And be direct about those things. You know, is this something that, you know, um, are you telling me you believe this? Explain it to me. Uh, listen for feelings. If somebody's telling you that they're scared, something like that, talk to them about it. Ask them how it feels. Observe body language. I bet all of you, I'm watching body language out here. Right and uh, I know this is kind of long, and sometimes it gets kind of dry, and I see the arms crossed, and sometimes it's a couple of things, sometimes it's telling me I don't want to listen to you. Uh, but somebody sitting there with a pen, clicking their ballpoint pen, uh, I, used to, I typically do an exercise when I call somebody up, and I have them tell you a story. And then I start interrupting them and asking them dopey questions that have nothing to do with anything, or clicking a pen, or rustling the paper, or anything like that. Watch for body language. And I'll tell you this too. Body language is even important in the telephone because, you know, the virgins, the masters of ceremonies, you're working on things on, on the telephone. Uh, years ago, when I was being a disc jockey, uh, one of my colleagues, told me, he says, gosh, Michael, well, you know, you're not feeling well, you can tell. Because you sound like, no, oh, I'm ready. And so he handed me a mirror and he said, smile. Look at yourself, smile, and then talk. Because this was a guy that could actually, his name was Dwayne Peters, a country western guy. And he could have a 200 degree temperature and be sitting back gasping for air and when it was time to make the mic active, you would think he was the happiest guy on the planet. He was just, he just wanted to be next to him and listen to him talk and everything like this. And then he turned the mic off and went back to his near-death experience. <laughs> but, uh, uh, it was, uh, but, and I know it's a couple of organizations that I've been in where there was a lot of telephone work going on out of town. So get on the mirror and smile because people, Hear that is body language. So hear your smile. So you know, observe body language, listen for body language, and uh, avoid interruption and distraction. Well, if you're trying to have a conversation with somebody and your phone is on, it's going off, it's not going to work. Well. Or if you let people come up and keep interrupting you. So you know, have your conversation someplace private uh, and, uh, and go from there. And, uh, and then, again, what are they asking? And that's part of the, can you tell me what time it is? And lastly, signal encouragement. Tell me more. Tell me more about what you're feeling. Tell me more about what you're thinking. Tell me more about how you're coming to this decision. Why you're taking this position. Ask them. It's totally fine to ask people to give more information. So, I'm getting towards the kind of the end here. The email minefield, 50% of the cases that came to me as an ombudsman over the year started with an email. And uh, more like the John Smith thing here in the corner says, You're an idiot. Your ability to totally miss the boat astonishes me. I don't know how many times I've seen it. Uh, and then, like, making it worse, somebody would respond. Pretty much the same way. I'm not an idiot. You're the idiot. You know, what are you talking about? You had no business talking to me like this because you're totally stupid. That's seen stuff like this. You know, and uh, you get into this fight and flight thing, you know, um, and what astonishes, astonishes me more is you get in this, you have people in emails that sit 10 feet from one another. 10 feet. And they won't talk to each other. And uh, so 
they get into this whole thing of blame schemes. So we talked about emotions before, how that feeds into things, or being defensive, <laughs> or Jane or even slut, I love that. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, it's all or nothing, or just whatever, and I don't that wrong, I didn't know what it was maybe, but, <laughs> but uh, it's, You know, blaming people is just, you go back to the whole idea of talking to people about impact. Mm-hmm. Don't look at somebody or write an email and say, you are an idiot, and I know what you're, I know what you're thinking, and you're wrong, and so on and so forth. Because that's always blaming. Talk to them about impact. Here's the first rule of email uh, communication. Don't. <laughs> just don't do it. <laughs> I would tell people when you get something and I give classes to people in, in the organizations I serve with, you get an email, open a, you really feel like you're compelled to need to write something, open a word and talk to it. Don't get reply and start typing. Because 90% of the time you're going to regret it. So open a work and I can get, the, get it out of your system and you'll feel better and all those types of things. And there is a, uh, and take some time before you start reacting to it. There's time. You give yourself time. And uh, I'm not going to get too much. So the question you have to ask is, do you need to respond to an email that insults you? Well, my first response is no, you don't. And here's some reasons you know, that nobody else is involved in going into. If you've already talked about this discussion and they're just being unhappy with you, I don't see the reason to respond. But if you have to respond, just yes, I think fear would be good to. I think fear would be good to make a distinction between response and reaction. And I think both the why well, don't just think this? So here's the thing. Both things are necessary. You will have a reaction and you may or may not need to respond and you may still have a response. But you if you are you have to be uh, you have to allow both to exist. Because if you don't, you'll be fighting. So the truth of the matter is, you have a res- you have a reaction. You are an idiot. No kidding. And you've got to be a double idiot to think you can call me an idiot. Okay, that may be a reaction, but you still got to have it. You do. Your response, however. <laughs> is the thing that comes after the space of you getting that you had your reaction, acknowledging that it is your reaction, telling the truth about that, taking a deep breath and then going, ah, then writing whatever you're going to say next. Yeah. And you're right, yeah. you, are, you are going to have a reaction. Everybody does. And uh, um, I think and you have to acknowledge that. That's where you have to give your space to yourself. And we're running out of time, so I want to kind of hurry through the rest of this stuff. So, um, again, if you have to, if you have to respond, start out with word and, and really get interested. Go ahead and react in the word. That's okay. Before you get to having to, to really reply, but then you ask yourself the questions you're trying to manage the relationship, reduce the relationship, or end it. And guy here in town by the name of Bill Eddy, who's a social worker attorney who mediates a lot of women nasty divorce cases and stuff. He's written several books about high conflict personalities. And one of his little books is called If, which means brief, informative, friendly, and firm. And this is how you respond to them. So if somebody writes to you, you're a baby. Right, so if you have to respond, I received your email. I understand what you're saying. Thank you for your email. Goodbye. 
And don't get into blaming. You don't get into any of the stuff. You're acknowledging it and moving on. That's a, by the way, that's an end relationship, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, just think about it a little bit. Brief. You know, don't get into blaming. Four a couple of sentences. I've received your email. Thank you for that. And uh, friendly. And keep it friendly. You know, they're calling an idiot or something like that. And firm. End it. And uh, or if you must, if you, if you need something, you ask. Clarify this. What do you mean? I'm not sure I understand. That's okay. But you don't get into somebody sent you four paragraph email. Send them back three sentences. Uh, four paragraphs. And here's the things to avoid. You don't give them advice. You don't admonish them. And you don't apologize. You just, I got it. Thank you. I need clarification. Goodbye. Okay? So here's the last part. These are tips. This is kind of a summary. These are tips to engage conflict and productive. Stay calm. Neuroscience tells us that people, when they get in conflict, stop breathing. They start holding their breath. And those that do, the conflict gets worse. So force yourself to breathe. Think about breathing. Don't rush. You don't have to deal with the conflict right now. Just don't have to. Not generally. Put it off a little, a little bit. Slow down. Consider your emotional intelligence. We talked about that. How are you feeling? How are they feeling? What are they telling you about how they feel? Meet face to face. You don't have to send an email. Get up and go talk to someone. I know it's a scary thing for some people, but actually sit there and talk with them and show them you're interested and encourage them to tell you what's going on. If you must use an email, use Biff. The book is only about this big. It's pretty inexpensive. It's actually a great book. Great book. And most of Bill's stuff is really pretty good. Uh, it's not about you, especially in the context of ministry. It's not about you, but it's about the relationship. That relationship with the person, with God. So think about that. Don't make it about yourself. Appreciate that the others are different. They have different experiences, styles, approaches. And take that in. Understand that that's going to be a good thing. Learn from them. And they have different information. So many times in, in mediations or just whatever, you find out that people simply have different information. Uh, and the other side didn't know that. And they're going, oh, I didn't know about that. And it changes the dynamic of the conflict. Maybe it reduces to a disagreement, it's no longer a big conflict. Separate the person from the problem. Hard on the issues. Soften the person. Start making it hard on the person, blaming them. Because Conflict is what it is. Always two stories and both of them make sense. Don't blame. Ask the question. Be curious. Ask them what happened. And talk about how you were impacted. Don't assume intentions. And listen to learn. My business card at one of the universities I was at said, said, listen without judgment. And that's so critical listen to somebody and listen with an open mind. Repeat and reflect. Refrain if you can, but if you can repeat and reflect what people have said, you're, you're, you've gone huge steps into resolving and reducing the conflict itself. Because they know they're hurting. Use I statements. It, this hurt me. And I feel this way. Don't go, you make me feel this way. I feel this way. This is how it hurts. This is why I'm impacted this way. Use I statements. 
Watch the body language. Look for a mutually agreeable solution. You can't have it your way all the time. And uh, so look for one. And don't be afraid to apologize. I've had people tell me if I apologize, I can sue me. Not really. <laughs> yeah. Tell somebody I'm sorry this was hurt. But what's the one or two words you never use in your apology? But. What is it? But. B U T. But. But. That is the one big word. Gosh, I'm sorry you're hurting. I, I wish this hadn't happened to you. But. Go back to square one and back where you started. Because you qualify your you qualify what you basically have done is a blame. So but uh, is the big word that I use. And here's the thing, conflict is inevitable, it's gonna happen no matter what, we have it every day. Combat is optional. <laughs> and, uh, have any questions in the last one second here? <laughs> Do you, we have about one second. Did you bring prints of the slide by any chance? I did, but I can give them to Lisa and then she can send them out. Yeah, if you'd like to have them, okay. Yeah, okay. And thank you. <laughs>